Huge crowds have descended on London for what's shaping up to be an event like no other in British history. The deaths of the British monarch and senior members of the British royal family has always been marked by pageantry and formality. Queen Victoria's state funeral in 1901 was at the time the largest gathering of European royalty to take place. And when the Queen Mother died in 2002, 200,000 plus people lined up to visit her coffin lining in state. It's different now. Mobile phones ensuring anyone can create their own piece of personal digital history. Yet when you strip away the trappings of modernity, and we saw this last night, as people got out of their cars to bow their heads as the hearse carrying the Queen's body passed by. We're seeing it today too as people prepare to line up in the cold morning as it is here now to wait. So while it is different than in the past, it's still very much an example of the best British traditions in so many ways. Joining me now from the city of Exeter is author and historian Jeremy Black. Jeremy, welcome to the show. I, I appreciate you coming on because today we, we change gears in a sense. We'll see a lot of military processions, particularly this afternoon at 2.22 when the Queen's hearse will, Queen's coffin will leave Buckingham Palace. It will be on a gun carriage and it will involve sailors. What will we see and what's the significance of these events? Well, the significance of the events is a public mourning by the royal family and the combination of both as your previous uh, speakers were saying, the private element, that it's obviously private grief, but also that it is a public show of respect, uh, is very instructive. Uh, you correctly noticed the gun carriage and the sailors. Uh, Her Majesty was the head of the armed forces. That remains an important element in their culture and indeed in the country as a whole. Um, I think it's fair to say that in a... Um, you know, a, a mature democracy, Australia, Canada, Britain are mature democracies. There are often um, strongly held different political views. And there is a lot to be said for having the armed forces under a impartial, neutral figure um, who um, can be trusted and relied upon to stay out of the, um, the grief and strife of politics. Give, give us some history behind the use of a gun carriage. Well, a gun carriage was developed, gun carriages were developed in the 18th century. Uh, they essentially come from the idea of horsed artillery and the horsed artillery pulling forward guns at speed on the battlefield as a development of then. It then became used in the 19th century at a much slower pace to put a coffin on. I mean, it, people realized that it was about the right size. Um, it, it, what it does is a number of things. First of all, it raises the coffin above the crowd so that people can more readily see the coffin. Secondly, it's much more mobile than, shall we say, a wagon would have been. And thirdly, it actually can move at very varied paces. Now, as you will already have heard, they're actually pulling forward this gun carriage rather than using horses. Horses will go at a certain speed. They are larger, they're faster than human beings. By having human beings do it, you move it at a slower pace. Um, the use of it for funerals was also matched by the traditional uh, pastime practice, I should say, of honouring uh, people. For example, I remember reading an account of Field Marshal Haig after World War I coming to Cambridge to receive an honour. And he arrives at the railway station. Um, he's going to be pulled in a carriage by horses. The horses were taken off and... Uh, students pulled him through the streets as a sign of honour. The Queen will lie in state from uh, this evening at Westminster Hall for four days. I think my audience has got a good understanding now of the history of Westminster Hall. But the term lying in state, take us through that because we know uh, the Imperial State Crown will rest on her coffin as will of course the Royal Standard. The last queen, of course, to lie in state was the Queen Mother. This is a significant honour. 
Yes, it's a very great honour. It's entirely appropriate for Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. Uh, you will recall your cameras earlier showed your uh, correspondent in Parliament Square with a statue in the background of Sir Winston Churchill. Sir Winston Ch Churchill uh, lay in honour there in 1965, uh, lay in state in 1965. It is a great uh, honour. It is entirely appropriate and it represents an opportunity, as you're seeing now and as your, uh, your interviewer interviewed an uh, Australian who'd flown all the way. It's an opportunity for people as a whole, irrespective of their rank or background, their gender, uh, their political preferences, whatever, to come and you know, say, say, say thank you, basically. We've seen, um, obviously, you know, practice happen overnight with the various regiments. There's a lot uh, of different regiments involved. This has been years in the planning. I made a comment to Sarah before. I mean, it would be a constant reminder of your own mortality to be involved decades out in your funeral. But this has been years in the planning, hasn't it? Yes, it's been years in the planning, and you very, you very sensibly discussed, um, you know, is there, as it were, something that is slightly strange about doing that? And the answer is no. If you're a monarch, uh, you have to have a sense of continuity. You represent yourself, you represent your family, you represent an office, uh, a role. Um, and all of those you're well aware of. I, I did a biography some years ago of George III, and I can recall George III going to see the tomb of Edward II, for example. If you're a monarch and you're walking around Buckingham Palace, you will know that there are many paintings there and other memoria, uh, memorability from previous monarchs. So you have a, a real sense of being part of a continuing process. You mentioned the regiments. Of course, the regiments chosen are those with particular links um, to Her Majesty. The, uh, the Crown, obviously, is both head of the armed forces, but there are also specific regiments, for example, the Household Cavalry, uh, the Foot Guards, that have a tradition linked to, as it were, caring for and guarding the monarch. Professor Black, thank you for your time. Thank you for the insights.